Hello and welcome to this overview of the NAD C370 audio amplifier recapping and repair. A little bit of background, the NAD C370 was introduced in the year 2002 and provides an output power of 120 watts per channel for 8 or 4 ohms. It actually had an electronic circuit which is called the impedance sense circuit which NAD designed it to adjust the power supply to ensure that maximum voltage and current is then applied even if the impedance or the load on the speaker terminals for example changes from 8 ohms to 4 ohms. It has 7 inputs, it has a headphone socket, it provides two speaker output connections so this is uh, for speaker set A, speaker set B or speaker set 1 or speaker set 2 remote control functionality and then at the rear of the amplifier you have two links which connect the pre-amplifier output 1 to the main input and what that simply means is that the pre-amplifier can be connected to a separate amplifier if required or alternatively when the links are removed the user may also connect a different type of pre-amplifier then to the main output amplifiers or power amplifiers within the device it also has a pre-amplifier output 2 function but you also have then a level adjustment which can be seen at the back of the amplifier and that enables you then to adjust it to such a level that it then matches the device that uh, you're connecting into then. In terms of overall construction, uh, robust in itself, uh, you know, good metal chassis, good components uh, throughout and most importantly from a repair point of view it's modular in construction. So what that simply means is that if you're undertaking repair or service work, it's relatively easy to take out the different assemblies of the amplifier and then work on them on the bench separately. And that makes fault finding and service and repair much more easier than maybe an audio amplifier where it's all built onto one main board. And of course, for some of the later models which are using uh, dual or multi-layered circuit boards, that non-modularity can uh, extend the repair time and also uh, create other issues in terms of actually getting into the device and then making tests and then measurements then. So when you look at the video, what you'll see is a series of snapshots or photographs which show you the different stages of the repair of the amplifier and then also the servicing as well. And throughout this overview tutorial, what I will introduce are different aspects or conversations around different areas of the amplifier and really give some more detailed information. And what I would also say is that this is not unique to this particular model of amplifier. You can take a lot of the information which we're providing today and you can apply that if you wish to other amplifier repairs um, in the future. So first of all, where this amplifier came from, it came in from a customer. Um, what the customer said or requirement was that they wanted it to be recapped. They understood, you know, it was a relatively old unit. Um, the top cover had been removed, so the end user had already identified that many of the large power supply smoothing capacitors were raised or bulged. So, and of course, that's the normal requirement. So, when you receive the amplifier in the workshop, the first thing, of course, is a visual inspection. Um, what that process really is undertaking is to identify any areas of concern which without any form of test equipment you can visually see and that's an outside inspection to ensure that there's been no damage during transit and delivery then to the workshop and then also physically what you're looking for is any areas of the electronics and circuits which may be being exposed to uh, heat or maybe you can uh, identify maybe an electronic component which appears maybe to have burnt out or failed. And what you see in the video is exactly that situation. So what you see are the large power supply smoothing capacitors, which are clearly failed. They're bulging on the top, as we said, and also uh, one of them is almost broken away from the board. And then what you also see is on the line in module, you'll see R220. And this is a 499 ohm resistor. And this is metal film, quarter watt. And this is in the area of circuit, which is for the right channel. And 
this issue is picked up not just visually, but during the initial test phase. And the test phase that is used in this case is that the amplifier is connected up via the dim bulb tester to act as a current limiting device. And then when um, the speaker protection relay changed over, we knew that there was no excess high DC because the protection circuit had not operated. And it was safe to connect uh, some headphones directly. There was no high DC. Um, what could be heard is that the left channel, although not the best in terms of audio quality, was, was there. It could be the volume level could be increased, etc. And different inputs then selected. But what was discovered with the right channel is that it was very, very low. So there was no amplification whatsoever. And that was attributed to the fault which was uh, later discovered during the uh, fault finding procedure and also the repair of the amplifier, where the input... Uh, field effect transistor, which you'll see in the video, had failed short circuit at some point in time, and in turn that had also resulted in excess current draw and the failure of R220. With regard to the startup of the amplifier, it is microprocessor based, so when you first apply power, when you uh, switch on the amplifier, it will come from its standby mode then, and after a few seconds, Providing everything is okay, the speaker protection relay, of course, will then change over. And what you'll then see is that the power LED will change to green, and the LEDs for the input selection, etc., will illuminate. The actual startup system itself comprises of a startup transformer, and you'll see that in the video, and it is highlighted. There is a small, what we refer to as like a top hat or chassis mount type transformer. And what this is doing is this is providing the initial voltages. Uh, directly to the microprocessor and then once the diagnostics has been cleared i.e. there has been no fault detected what will happen then is that the microprocessor then will energize the main power relay which will then energize the large toroidal transformer that you see in the video and what the large toroidal transformer is providing is multiple voltages so the first voltage is, is the higher current required for the output modules left and right and that is both a plus and minus 64 volt DC supply. We also mentioned previously that there's already the 5 volt DC supply for the micro, but it's also used in other areas of the circuit. And then you then have what I would term as a sub power supply. So this is generated in the plus 12 volts DC. There's also a plus or minus 34 volt DC and also a 24 volt DC as well. Uh, part of the detection system will also uh, detect if AC is present because there's a protection circuit in there. It needs to identify if there is AC present, i.e. is the amplifier powered. And then when the amplifier is turned off, of course, then it will then sense that there is then a loss of AC power. The first area we really want to focus on here, and you see this again in the video, is the power supply capacitors. So for the large four power supply capacitors which are rated at 10,000 microfarad at 50 volts. These uh, capacitors sometimes are regarded in different ways. So what I mean by that is that you may hear different terminology. So you may hear, yeah, large power supply capacitors, but equally so you may also um, be referred to as rail capacitors or they may be referred to uh, as reservoir capacitors. So really the function of these capacitors is that once the AC from the power transformer has been rectified by the bridge rectifiers to convert from AC then to DC, the next part of that circuit then is to remove what we call the 100 Hz ripple. So when we rectify both the positive and negative half cycles of the AC voltage, what we need to do then is to remove this 100 Hz ripple. So what the power supply capacitors are doing in that area is that it's acting as a filter. So it's removing out this 100 hertz ripple. And then if you had an amplifier where maybe the capacitors had failed, it's not uncommon to hear, hear like a buzzing noise through the speakers or headphones. Um, more common and this is associated because it's common cause. It's on both channels and it will be linked to the failure of the power supply capacitors, i.e. that they have dried out. And they have no ability then to actually smooth out that AC ripple. When we say the term reservoir capacitor, that also is describing a main function of those large capacitors. 
So what they're able to do, of course, is then to charge up, and that ensures that under varying demand, i.e. load, that as the amplifier volume is increased, or maybe there's fluctuations in the audio signal, i.e. it becomes louder, those rail capacitors or reservoir capacitors are able to ensure the uh, constant current is, uh, is provided. And in case of repair, physically you may look at one of these capacitors and there may not be any visual sign. You may not see any bulging at all. And it's not until you remove the capacitor and you test it with an equivalent series resistance meter that you're able to determine that, that it has a high uh, equivalent series resistance or a very, very low value. And often if you actually shake them, you can hear them rattle. So the capacitor is completely dried out. And what you're listening to there is the cardboard format with insulation in between. And at that point, of course, the capacitors must be replaced. You may also look around by the capacitors and see some form of liquid damage. But please don't confuse the liquid damage with what is commonly seen in this vintage of amplifiers, which is a brown glue that is used to provide additional structural support. That brown glue, when first applied during manufacture, works perfectly fine. But of course, over time, and we pinpoint this in the video again, that it becomes extremely corrosive and also slightly conductive. So any amplifier which you're planning on to work on, if you see this glue, and often it will cover additional components, wired links on the board, or maybe resistors, remove it, make sure you use some form of eye protection so this hardened glue doesn't spring up and cause eye injury, and then any components which are contaminated or any wire links, remove it, clean it up, and get it off the board before you even consider installing any new capacitors into there. Okay. And again, we refer to the video, but it does actually show you in the smaller power supply section, the brown glue, and then also in the main power supply section as well. Now, when you look at the capacitors in the power supply, they have an extremely hard life. And different manufacturers, of course, will look to source different capacitors from different manufacturers. But the point here, and I fully understand that there's always a lot of discussion around capacitors with regard to audio amplifiers, but there's a number of areas which need to be considered. The first one is that when the manufacturers design the amplifiers, they're looking at a particular market. And what they're looking at is to get in there with a price point, which is attractive to the potential uh, purchaser of the amplifier, but also as well, they're competing within that market space against other audio amplifier manufacturers. So in the same, we could use the example of, of maybe cars. You would have VW who would produce a, a motor vehicle and it could be under the brand name of Skoda. Then you would then have VW. Then, for example, you may have Audi. And then you would then have the higher end, which would then be Bentley. And that's the same here. So they will use a brand of capacitor. But please be aware that you're not going to see a very high brand of capacitor with a huge operational life in an amplifier, which maybe is an entry level amplifier or it's a midpoint. As soon as you get to high end, then that's a different matter. Because often those amplifiers are hand built. They could be uh, retailing for upwards of £3,000 or maybe higher. And they know that the particular market they're looking for and those kinds of buyers will buy on the value. So they're prepared to pay for that particular amplifier because of the quality of the design, the quality of the construction, the components that are used, and most importantly, the sound reproduction. So when you look at this recapping of the NAD C370, they are Nikicon uh, capacitors that are used, and in the audio processing circuit, then they are all audio grade. In the other ones, it's not physically possible, for example, to replace the main power supply capacitors with audio grade, because they're physically too large to fit into there. So we still keep the same brand okay, throughout the amplifier, but those capacitors cannot be the audio um, grade. It's impossible to put them in place there. So... When we talk about capacitors, the thing that you need to look at is the make and type of capacitor. Normally, there will be a product number on there of a particular line of capacitors. And then if you refer to the technical data sheet, it will tell you on there what is the operational hours. So this will be in hundreds of thousands of hours of operation. And it will also detail in there 
the operating temperature. So commonly 85 degrees max and also up to 105 degrees max. But remember, it depends on what the capacitor is being used for. I.e. in a power supply, it's going to have a hard life. Also, the number of hours that the user is using the amplifier over, how many times it is powered up over its lifetime. And also as well, that if the environment that it's in, for example, if a capacitor is mounted close to a heat sink, maybe in a power output module, or maybe next to uh, high power resistors or regulators, what will happen then is that the capacitor will be subjected to higher ambient temperatures than what would be normal. And then what you will have then is an aging effect. So that means that the life of the capacitor will then be reduced. And you need to bear this in mind when you look at different types of capacitors and also where the capacitors are situated in the overall design of the circuit. Now, what I'm not doing here is criticizing the NAD C370 design. But when a amplifier is manufactured, then of course it should work perfectly well outside of its warranty period with no issue. But over time, what you can see is stock faults start to appear. So this is where commonly maybe you had 10 of these types of amplifiers in the workshop during the year. And more commonly, you would probably find that nine out of 10 of the faults are gonna be directly linked to age-related faults, which could also attribute to the design. So what I refer to here is that you can see in the video that in the lower voltage power supply section, the electrolytic capacitors, smoothing capacitors, squeezed in quite tightly, and also on the power output modules, and they're right next to heat sinks, dissipating heat, high power resistors. So what is happening there is that you get this discoloration of the capacitors in most cases, and then the capacitors will go open circuit, completely fail. Now in terms of failure mode for capacitors, then of course the capacitor can fail open, i.e. there is no capacitance at all, it's completely open circuit, or the, it goes higher in resistance, it's inability to store uh, current any longer over time, and you see that from a visual effect in many cases, but the capacitor may also become leaky over time, not physically leaky, but it's unable to maintain that charge, as well as going short circuit. And I'm aware, of course, like anyone, if you wish, you can purchase test equipment where you can measure the equipment series resistance. You may have uh, the ability to measure an electrolytic capacitance in terms of microfarads using a digital multimeter, or you build your own test equipment, or you buy a component tested to the go do that. With an ESR meter, you can test an electrolytic capacitor in circuit because it generates a one kilohertz signal. But the best test really in terms of go or no go is to remove the capacitor and then do a measurement of the capacitor out of the circuit itself to confirm you know, what condition that is in. The other important point to mention is the sourcing of these electrolytic capacitors. And I can't emphasize this enough. Unfortunately, uh, the marketplace is flooded with counterfeit components, both semiconductors and also discrete components, for example, capacitors, resistance, etc. So if you're sourcing electronic components, always source them from a reputable supplier. Okay, just because it says, for example, Rubicon on the side of the capacitor, actually, if it's coming from a particular part of the world, it may not be even Rubicon at all. And it's simply been put into a um, canister uh, with a copy uh, label on there. You believe you're buying it, but actually from a, a functional point of view, it's not even close to the original part. And also in terms of longevity, it's not going to be the same. Now, I appreciate that some of these components are relatively expensive, particularly when you start buying uh, large power supply capacitors, but that purchase price is for a reason. So don't be tempted to think, you know, I can go and buy four high power power supply capacitors, you know, for a few dollars or a few pounds, um, and the retail normally from, from say, Musa or um, DigiKey is in the order of maybe £10 or $12, whatever it may well be. Don't take the compromise, fit the appropriate part, and that will ensure that the repair itself is good, and then also the fact that you have the longevity of the repair as well. Now, just a point with regard to recapping of audio amplifiers. It is something which is done extensively, and engineers will undertake the work on behalf of customers. 
or you yourselves may be looking to do this work as well. If it's a small amplifier, then the number of capacitors, of course, will be less than a larger one. But what I would tell you to do is just to do two things. Number one, make the time. Okay, don't undertake recapping of an amplifier and try and rush the work. Okay, so make the time and then take the time. Okay, so same thing applies here. When you are removing the capacitors and then fitting the new capacitors, you need to take your time. Okay, so you need to verify that if it's a polarity type electrolytic capacitor, there are non-polarity types which are used in signal processing. Check the orientation of the capacitor. Also as well, make sure that you are doing a section at a time. So like if you were cutting some wood, measure twice, cut once. So here if you install the capacitor, check it multiple times, ensure you have the correct orientation. But remember the capacitors have two other important factors here. That is the actual value of the capacitor, i.e. for example 4.7 microfarad. It is very easy if you have lots of capacitors maybe to install that you accidentally pick up maybe a 47 microfarad capacitor and pop that into the circuit, unaware that you've just changed the capacitance value. So always verify the correct value to confirm that's what you're installing. And then also the operational voltage. Okay? With the capacitor itself, you can increase the voltage, that's fine. But what you don't want to be doing, of course, is decreasing the voltage. So if it's maybe a 60, 3 volt capacitor and you accidentally fit maybe a 35 volt capacitor then of course when the amplifier powers up it could take a few seconds but it will probably explode and then cause all other issues in the circuit so most importantly make it the time and then take the time and check your work even to the point when you've done the complete recap of the amplifier before you're at that initial test phase double check your work make sure that there's no solder bridges there's nothing which has not been soldered correctly and the orientation the operational voltage and the value of the capacitor itself okay, so make sure all that now when we come back to the repair description here you can see that the video also shows the um, main board removed it also shows the front board which is the tone board and on there you also have the signal processing modules which are shown these are the vertical modules which are in uh, metal casing with a plastic cap top on there and there's actually four of them in the amplifier so you find them at the line input stage which is where we mentioned earlier where we had this failure of the resistor and then also the FET for the right channel and you also see two of these modules also on the tone board and on that board you'll see your control potentiometers which is your balance control bass and treble the tone defeat which will simply switch out those tone circuits and then run the signals directly then to the main amplifier uh, and really what you're looking for when you're doing this strip down of course you're also doing a visual inspection of the solder side of the board now over time because this is 60 40 lead tin solder whether you have capacitors for example which are heavy or you have power components which you have heat you will find a breakdown of the solder joint so when you're doing this recapping make sure that you are checking each one of those solder joints and if you need to reflow the joints if they are power resistors you may also find discoloration on the board and you could also find as well that the circuit board track underneath has become brittle over time so remember about the longevity of the repair you may need to uh, repair that, that, that your track itself to put more mechanical strength back into using link wire and ensuring that that connection is good there's nothing worse than you trying to rely on maybe a flimsy track which has been subjected to excess heat then trying to install a new component slight touch of it and then it then breaks away from the board and then you have other issues now the video shows the two modules and then also the modules removed from the main heat sinks. You can see that there is discoloration on the electrolytic capacitors, but because they're modular in terms of construction, in this case what was done, that the two power output modules were recapped first, and then also the power resistors which are highlighted were also resoldered, desoldered, and then new soldered then applied. And um, 
that was done on both the left channel and then on the right channel but again systematic approach take the time to do the recapping don't feel rushed when you're doing that and um, because these are the audio power output modules all of the capacitors which are installed were Nikicon and they are the audio gray capacitors which are then shown in the video then when you look at the main board again you have multiple dry joints which were identified and that board was completely checked around the power regulators and also the power supply capacitors were replaced in the low voltage power supply sections but one of the photographs is also pointing to a vertical board which is mounted towards the rear of the amplifier towards the speaker terminals what this board is is the actual speaker speaker protection circuit now when you look on there there is quite a large wattage resistor and this really just acts as a heater and the electrolytic capacitors on that board were completely dried out because of the high operating temperature and companies do sell repair kits where they'll provide the electrolytics for for example the C370 uh, speaker protection system and I'm not discouraging you from purchasing those but all of these capacitors have been in the amplifier for the same period of time so again if you're going to maybe look to take this work on you could probably replace some of the capacitors and get some degree of operation maybe extended life but really by the time you're pulling the capacitors out checking them and then making another measurement and maybe soldering them back in they're kind of okay they're not failed you're probably better off just replacing them completely and the audio grade capacitors the signal capacitors are not that expensive okay so just make a complete list note the voltages you can refer to the uh, service manual which is readily available online and for companies you know all electronic companies you can quickly build up a uh, bill of materials or parts list you can save that if you have the account and then make the purchase then and then just sort them out when they come and then go through and then fit each one of those then and uh, that will add the longevity part to it you don't need to be uh, just doing like half a repair the video also shows the front panel removed so what it's showing here is the microprocessor board and you also have the input selection switches on there as well there's actually two electrolytic capacitors on that board so again you may well purchase for example a recap kit for a NAD C370 and I think they quote probably about 59 capacitors but actually there's more capacitors in the amplifier than that and the reason being is that you have the two capacitors mounted on the microprocessor board not a hard life but they've still been in for that duration of the amplifier's operational life but you will also find in the signal conditioning modules the lining and the preamp modules if you remove the top cover and it just simply snaps on the top or more often these small plastic pegs will just break off so you'll, you'll need to refix that or use some form of tape once you release the side screw that's just simply releasing the heat sink you can pull the module out and what you'll find there is that there are three electrolytic capacitors on that board they're, they're small miniature not surface mount but they are smaller than the standard capacitors but with now modern day capacitors there should be no issue then just replacing those there's two 10 microfarad capacitors in there and then uh, also a uh, 35 microfarad, microfarad capacitor also so in terms of approach it's entirely up to yourselves you may well strip the amplifier down and then get underway to do the main board first of all or you say okay well i'm going to start off with the, the the power modules there's no right or wrong to that okay you can adopt whatever approach you want but make sure that you work systematically checking all of your work and then you get to the point where you've completed all of the recap in the case of this amplifier the resistor was replaced and also the uh, field effect transistor which is shown in the video and then you're at that point in time then where you've done the cleanup of the amplifier you've done everything that you need to and now you're at the point where you're doing the test phase so please don't just plug all the modules in and then power up the amplifier okay what you need to do here is you need to do a, a staged power up particularly for an amplifier like this so the first thing that i'm going to put onto there is the current bulb limiter okay so i'll put that into the video which shows you from an earlier video from the channel 
And what this is doing is, is a 100 watt filament light bulb, which is wired in series with the incoming main supply. So when I'm doing the first test of this amplifier and all other amplifiers, what I've done for the, NAD, the NADC 370 is I've disconnected the left and right channel modules. These are the power modules. And then what I'm doing is I'm applying power then to the amplifier. And then what I'm looking to do here is to ensure that I've got the 63 volt supplies. I also need to be checking the 5 volt supplies, the 12 volts, etc. And all being good, if I then power up the amplifier after a few seconds, you should hear the speaker protection relays change over. And then the front panel LEDs will then illuminate for the input selection. And then I can then get underway then to check the voltages to ensure that they are correct before I'm even thinking about connecting up the power output modules left and right. Now, just a point about um, amplifiers which have, for example, a large toroidal transformer and you have these large electrolytic capacitors. If you're using a dim bulb tester, you may actually see light quite brightly initially and then after a few seconds it will start to go dimmer. That is perfectly normal. The reason for that is that the large electric capacitors are now charging up. So it will take a few seconds for that then to happen. So it goes, the bulb grows bright and then it then goes dim. Totally normal. But if you had the situation where the bulb, for example, was going bright and then pulsing, that would indicate to you that you had maybe another issue with the amplifier and you need to be aware of that. So for this amplifier, what I was doing was I was checking all of the different voltages. But remember that that main board and all of the signal processing will be checked. So I could verify that the right channel fault had been cleared, which it had through the replacement of the FET and then also the resistor. But because on the rear, I can now apply a test signal of one kilohertz sine wave up to 100 millivolts for this test. But normally most line inputs will go up to about 250 millivolts. And then what I'm doing then is I'm checking the output from the preamp at the rear. So this is preamp one and then preamp two. What I could see on the oscilloscope is a very, very clean sine wave, which is absolutely perfect in line, same amplitude, no distortion whatsoever. That tells me that I've now completed that recap correctly. The fault has now been repaired. And then I'm at the point now where I can now start to connect the power output modules. So the next part of that is simply to connect one of the power output modules, not both of them. So in this case, we connected the, the left channel. And then I was then able to bring the amplifier up again by the dim bulb tester. No excess current consumption was seen. And then finally, power down the amplifier and then connect the right channel and then power the amplifier up. The next part of the test then is to do any initial adjustment. So for the NADC 370, you have three alignments which you need to complete. The first one is that you're doing what we term the DC offset adjustment. So that's where you will connect a multimeter across the positive and negative of each one of the terminals power up the amplifier and you can do this via the dim bulb tester initially but remember that for final adjustment you would remove the dim bulb tester and then apply power directly then from the incoming mains and then what we're doing here is we can do the initial one within a few minutes so i'm looking now to adjust it to plus or minus um, 30 millivolts to zero so ideally zero but it's, it's a finite adjustment so as long as it's not exceeding 30 millivolts plus or minus, then that adjustment then is correct. And the next part is that I'm then going to adjust the idle current. So this is the amount of current which would be flowing through the output transistors on the power output modules. So what again you're looking to do here is maybe an initial adjustment. And then after five, 10 minutes, you can then go back and then you can then check the DC offset again, make your final adjustments. And then finally, make your adjustment then for your current. If everything is correct, and no issue, then there should be no problem then adjusting the DC offset as per instructed. And the same then for the idle current. If you add a higher than normal DC offset, then what you would be looking to do there is not to look for a fault within the power output modules. That is not where you're going to see that problem. It's actually going to be in the input circuit stage where you have the actual 
I've said the adjustments are easier in the signal conditioning modules. And you're looking at the transistors, which are normally regarded as what we call the long tail pair. So these are common connected transistors normally on the emitter. They should ideally be balanced from a gain point of view. And then when you do the offset there, what you're simply doing is preventing or to actually eliminate any DC offset plus or minus above the Z zero volt rail, which in turn would move up or down the signal. And that's typically what you would hear through the speakers if you didn't have, for example, the speaker protection circuit. So what the circuit is doing, of course, it's protecting your speakers in the event of high DC being measured. But equally so, there is a time delay when you switch on the amplifier. And the reason why that is there is it's allowing sufficient time then for the rail capacitor to charge up and also that voltage then to become stable. Then it will change over the speaker protection relays so you don't hear this DC thud or bump through the speakers, which can be extremely annoying. And the circuit is taking care of that. Once you've done the DC offset adjustment and then also the idle current adjustment, the only final part then is to actually set up the impedance sense adjustment. And that's quite straightforward. So you have two test points on the main board. And then what you're looking for then is a range of about minus 50 to minus 100 millivolts. Once that has been set, the next phase of the repair then is to put the amplifier on what we term as a soak test. So you put the amplifier running and you can you know, maybe run some music through it if you wish with your speakers connected or maybe you have a test signal. But you're looking to run this amplifier. In this case, it was run for 48 hours so over a number of days. And this is almost like a factory burning test in a way. When things are first manufactured, they put them on test. And what they're looking to do is to get any mortality rate from components, even though they're brand new, they can fail. And after that burning test, it would be cleared and then you know, packed and then shipped then to either the dealership or to the end customer. In the case of the repair, when you're doing the extended uh, soak test, because new components have been installed, you're just verifying that you know there's no issue. But again, because this is a restoration of an amplifier, you know, remember that all of those components in there have the same life. So a semiconductor, for example, even though you've recapped it, may well fail. You know, it, it, with any electronics, it's not, you know, if it will fail, it will always fail. It's just the when that you don't know. OK, so, you know, don't be overly concerned if you've worked on an amplifier and you've done everything right. And maybe it's work for, you know, 24 hours, maybe longer. And then, you know, a failure occurs, you know, often it's not going to be linked in any way to the work that you've already completed. It may well be that a semiconductor may be in the power supply, for example, or some other area of the amplifier has failed. And then it's then a case then to, uh, to repair that. But like all electronic repairs, you know, um, if, if you're going to do a recap, you know, on an amplifier like this and do a complete strip down, you know, you, you're going to need a amount of time. So you're not going to get this work done in two or three hours. This could be maybe, you know, eight to ten hours over a period of time. Maybe you work on it for a period and then you then come back and then you work on it again. What I would, as general guidance, is don't work on electronic equipment if you rush for time or if you feel tired, you know, because you're not going to deliver your best work if you feel tired or you, you know, you're stressed about something else. You know, give it a break. Make some notes if you're halfway through something and then come back and then continue on with the repair then. And then for this amplifier, the customer did make a request. They didn't want the integral uh, cable for the power. They wanted to have an IEC socket fitted. And the video shows this. So you can see that there's an IEC socket fitted at the back. And then the uh, power then to the uh, startup circuit, etc. With the inline ferroid filter which was internal to the amplifier was then installed and that just gave the customer more versatility and then the other part which was done that there was some slight physical damage on the front fascia so this was simply uh, restored so it was re-blended back to the NAD pewter grey uh, and then cosmetically when you look from the amplifier you, you can't even see you know that there was any uh, damage on there and you can't see any paint blemish or anything like that. And then the final part here was a complete clean. So this is a complete clean of the outer case and the front fascia and then the rear. 
but before the recapping and repair was taking taking place all of the circuit boards were also uh, cleaned as well this is commonly done with a stiff wire or a stiff brush um, and then also compressed air so if you don't have access to maybe a compressor that can do that for you then this would be compressed air used for cleaning like a pc keyboard in a can and then um, that will ensure then that when you're working on it, you can quickly identify any component reference numbers on there uh, just a general point and this is linking back to the channel often uh, i do receive questions where people ask for technical information they say look i've got some burnout components on this particular area of the board remember that these are stereo amplifiers so if you have a burnout component maybe in the right channel really just have a look if your service manual is not available just have a look to the left channel and in most cases you'll be able to find its equivalent and then uh, identify what that component is and then just so to close out for this um, you'll also see in the video as well um, the headphone socket so this is of course always done as part of any service or repair the point to emphasize here is that there's always mechanical stress so on the rear you have these rca connectors you have the speaker connectors the headphone socket and wherever you have anything which is subject to mechanical stress there is a fair possibility that the uh, contact or the connection will break away from the board so again when you're in the fault finding process or you're doing a strip down and repair these are the areas that you need also then to check there's nothing more frustrated than you think oh i fixed the fault then you reassemble the amplifier only to maybe connect the headphones or maybe you connect the rca socket and you have an intermittent connection so flip the boards over scan all of the solder joints make sure there's nothing untoward in there and then the same with all of the user controls and switches make sure that you clean them with a high quality switch cleaner for example deoxid um, and then if you're clean, uh, cleaning potentiometers volume controls etc spray it into the access holes sometimes there aren't any so you've got to go and bring them out from underneath or maybe from the top or side and then just rotate those potentiometers backwards and forwards multiple times again apply some more uh, cleaning spray wait repeat the exercise and then you can mop up any excess uh, with kitchen roll and the same also then for some of the switches in some cases and not the case with the nad because it uses electronic switching via uh, relays but for amplifiers for example which use mechanical switches uh, simply cleaning with deoxid may not be enough and you can see in the many videos that i put up online you can see there that it requires the switches then to be disassembled taken apart and then clean them with a fiberglass pen and then deoxid then to provide some longevity to that so really that brings us to the close of this particular recap and repair for the c70 the reason why i've done an audio tutorial or overview for this is that the youtube channel now has been going for many many years and i do always appreciate the uh, comments which come in i do appreciate you know guidance where people are asking you know for more content um, the only thing which governs not to run complete repair tutorial videos is simply time the number of amplifiers which come through the workshop is in excess of 300 plus per year and to simply record and then to edit all of these different videos is considerable amount of time for example this video here has probably took about six hours to complete which is quite a long time but the reason why i've picked the c370 is i can look at the analytics on the youtube channel and i can see that this is a very very popular video and there's one already up on there i'll also add a technical write-up for this one because that's the you know the, the, the point of the channel that becomes a knowledge base and you wouldn't have to really listen to a complete audio recording to understand what was was done but i do accept that from a listener's point of view a, a subscriber or someone who is looking to repair you know there's nothing better than someone who's, who's telling you you know what that journey looks like and what to look out for and best practice and what to do and then also as well you become more connected to the channel and i do understand that you know if i was able to do live stream that would be even better and maybe in the future i could look to do that but it's only time that prevents me from doing it so i'd rather maybe in the future do a mixture so some amplifiers will have this audio tutorial 
other ones will just simply have the technical write-up for myself personally as a provider you know and this information is provided free you know i'm not asking in any way for payment i think it's better to have a lot of video repair descriptions on the site which will assist a huge number of people rather than that time restriction meaning that i'm only able to post maybe one or two repair descriptions you know every couple of months there's there's thousands on there now and that continues then to grow if you wish to do any form of um, donation at the end of the video you can see that the email address then but uh, that's not something you know you have to do and then if anyone out there requires any information about any aspects of repairing and servicing uh, audio amplifiers by all means just uh, drop a comment on the channel reference to the video that you're looking at or if you wish you can email audio amplifier servicing at AOL.com and I will come back to you um, just one other point as well which is important when you actually uh, look at the different videos on the channel remember that there's also the home page so if you click onto the audio amplifier servicing home page just at the right hand side what you will see is a search window now when the chart was created and it remains the same now the search descriptions and the naming formats are always the same so if you're interested for example to repair an rcam amplifier if you type rcam into there then you'll get all of the rcam repair videos come up you can then for example look for rcam 7r or in this case nad c370 as soon as you do that then of course it will show you all of those repair videos and if you're using a pc it's less easy if you're using a mobile device you'll see the repair description to the right so it's very very easy to pinpoint which one matches the faults that you're seeing and in most cases you'll actually find the component that you need to replace to restore the amplifier back i do from time to time receive uh, messages which i would not say uh, are always the positive kind of messages where people are maybe using a mobile device and all they see is a video showing the internals of an amplifier with a non-copyright audio track if you just click underneath there there is a drop down arrow and that's where you'll see the repair description so often i will then point people in the right direction then and then say look if you need any help by all means come back to me but really the purpose of the channel uh, just as we close here is to provide a knowledge base okay you know if you're looking to repair service or even fix your own device if you do that to google search or you go onto youtube you should arrive at audio amplifier servicing use the search function and then you should be able to locate your amplifier or you can email direct um and that to me is something which is important you know because i have subscribers worldwide and um, being able to help and to provide that information um, to everybody free of charge is really the sole purpose of that channel it's not designed to to make me a multi-millionaire or to create revenue for myself i'm very happy to uh, share experiences and share knowledge and gain knowledge and really that is the whole driver behind the channel so when you make comments and you contribute that also shapes the channel going forward and i would imagine there'll probably quite a few comments linked to this one because this is the first time that you've had such a uh, uh, such a, a, a repair video put up and then you've heard from myself the actual uh, gentleman behind audio amplifier servicing all right so with that i wish you uh, a good day or good evening or good morning depending on which part of the world you're in right now and uh, keep safe and uh, until the next time take care